Good morning, and today is September the 20th, and we are continuing our sermon series called God Only Knows. And today we're going to talk about self-worth. So we're continuing to do some stuff to get us uh, you know, spiritually a little bit healthier during this crazy season. So enjoy some of the songs, and I'll see you all in a little bit for the sermon. go to God now for a time of prayer. We continue the, the Acts model for prayer of uh, adoration and confession, thanksgiving and supplication. So let us first uh, begin this time of prayer with adoration. Gracious God, we praise you for being our creator. 
We praise you, Lord, for being our redeemer and our reconciler. That you know us and you call us by name. All creation sings your praises. All glory is given to you, Lord. And before we ask anything, before we confess anything, before we give thanks for anything, it all starts with a heart of of adoration and of worship for you, Lord. And now we come to a time of, of confession. Gracious God, we know that we fall short of your glory. We confess that we've not seen the good news to be good. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We know that there are things that we have done that we need to confess to you. And we have the, the opportunity, the privilege to, to open our hearts to the creator of the universe who wants a relationship with us, a better relationship with, with us, and gives us the opportunity to, to fully confess so that we can be fully forgiven. And so we lift up these prayers of confession right now. And now we shift to a prayer of, of thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for all the wonderful things that you have done, Lord. We thank you that, that we can confess. We thank you that you are a God then that, that forgives. We can praise you for being a God who, who answers prayer, that we are forgiven, we are redeemed. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to, to come to you with our prayers and for being a God who answers our prayers. And so in this time of thanksgiving, go to God and, and give thanks for some of those things that maybe we've asked for in the past. We thank you, God. We, uh, we come now, Lord, to uh, a time of supplication, which is a big fancy word for the time where we're going to ask you, Lord, to, to hear our prayers. And so we pray for creativity and we pray you, you pour out your Holy Spirit upon this church that we might be alive in creative ways to, uh, to, to face the challenges that are going on around us in new ways. We pray for the sick. We pray for those on the, the journey of rehabilitation. We pray for those who are struggling to find jobs, Lord, we pray that opportunities come. We pray for students and teachers and parents. Gracious God, we lift up the lonely. We lift up those who are feeling ever more isolated in this time. We pray that uh, new inroads are made to, to broken relationships and new communication paths are found to, to bring healing. We lift all this up in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Mark Steiner, and I'll be reading from the Old Testament book of Psalms and from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Please pray with me. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love and strength to follow on the path you set before us. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Our message this week comes from Psalm 139 verses 11 through 14. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the right around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. And now from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, 
is required of stewards that we be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to the light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive commendation from God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we come to part three of our sermon series, God Only Knows, and we've talked about the baggage that we carry, the, the guilt, the things from our past that we struggle with, the things that we've done that we feel guilty about, or the things that we didn't say or we didn't do. And we're kind of reminded that we are not perfect. 
that our lives, our past, it is messy. And we have to do some things that we have to kind of come to terms. We need to kind of deal with these things. And if, if you don't want to deal with these things, then you can just skip this Sunday. You can skip this and, and, and good luck to you. But maybe this might be a time where you kind of take a look at the things that are weighing you down and you can kind of understand that this journey of faith gives us amazing freedom once we kind of pull out the microscope and kind of take a look at what's going on in our heart and our lives, that there's a lot of great things that can come out of dealing with the things that we've kind of stuffed into these boxes in our mind and our hearts or the things that are nagging on us of the things that we've done wrong or the, the ways that we've wronged other people. And so the last couple of weeks, we've talked about guilt and guilt's kind of best buddy, shame. Those two things kind of seem to run hand in hand. But the next thing we want to talk about today is this uh, thing that we call self-worth. And that sense of the, the, the voices that we're hearing in our heads that are telling us that we are no good. These things that tell us that we are too fat, too dumb, too lazy. These things that we kind of buy into and believe that kind of weigh us down. These voices that are kind of telling us that, that no one likes you. No one really wants to, to kind of be your friend or that you're some kind of just kind of perpetual klutz or a, or a screw up. Or that if people really knew you, they would, they would turn tail and they would head for the hills. And that we do a lot of things, it's called self-sabotage, that kind of put us in, in, in relationships that are kind of almost destined from the beginning to fail so that we can kind of tell that big I told you so voice in our head, see, this is why these things are the way that they are. And so the, the heart of that is that sense of if God only knew how we felt about ourselves, if, if God could hear the tapes that are playing out in our minds. But the thing is about this journey of faith is that God does know. God knows and understands and then we have this opportunity to do some self-examination to kind of look at what's going on in our heads and then kind of figure out maybe what we can do to, to turn off these things that are cluttering up our minds and our, and our hearts and maybe have healthy relationships with other people, have healthy relationships with ourselves. And so as we kind of figure out this sense of, of self-worth, there's a couple of different avenues, a couple of different ways that kind of who we are kind of plays out. And the first one that I want to kind of talk about, about how the, the big picture of kind of who we are and kind of our goals, if you will, that is easily said sometimes that if we want to figure out what we're worth and what, what people think about us is that we need to kind of look outward. That in a very kind of traditional sense of our self-worth is kind of found in our roles and to the extent that we're kind of fulfilled in the roles that we have kind of helps how we kind of look outside to kind of see what we, who we are based on how the world defines us. You know, as a, as a man, if your, your father was a, a shoemaker or a farmer or a blacksmith, then guess what? Odds were pretty good that you were going to become a, a shoemaker or a farmer or a, or a blacksmith that you can kind of be defined by the jobs that you do. That happened then, I think that still happens now, depending upon the job that you do. I think it's harder in the technological age for people to really understand what it means when you say that you're a, you know, you're a programmer, you're a data analyst. People are like, okay, you're, you stare at a screen all day. Well, guess what, we're all staring at screens all day. But kind of who we are and what our work world kind of tells us is kind of where we look outward to kind of feel who we are and, and a little bit as to who our value is. And then it's the same for men as it is for women and kind of these kind of traditional roles that it's like, okay, I can identify myself as a man, as a, as a father, as a, as a worker, and, and women find the same thing, that who they are as a wife or as a mother and, and what you're doing as your roles with, within the family. And so we tend to kind of, our identity is almost handed to us. Oh, this is who you are based on who your family is. And that shows up a lot in kind of the Old Testament, that people kind of identified who they were with kind of where they could be found. And so, uh, you know, there's a story in the Old Testament of, of Abraham who, 
you know, is introducing himself to, you know, Rebecca and how Rebecca identifies herself. And this is in Genesis 24, 24. And how does Rebecca identify herself? She said, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milica, the boar of Nahor. She says who she is based on the family line that she is in. She doesn't say, I am Rebecca, hear me roar. She doesn't say, I'm the certain role that I have, it's kind of the family that I was born into. And I think a lot of us kind of see that same thing playing out in our self-worth. And sometimes when we let the world kind of dictate to us who we are, then what does it mean when the jobs that we have, the things that we do don't have that sense of, of worth and prestige, then suddenly if who you are is tied to a job that is very thankless or that nobody really sees or that no one really appreciates, then your sense of self-worth can somehow kind of get all kind of intertangled with that. But if there's this kind of old school, Old Testament view of kind of who you are is defined by your roles and what you do, Jesus comes on the scene and he kind of takes all of that and he puts it on its ear. Because as the folks that were the traditionalists kind of look at him and they say, hey, you can't do it this way. You can't be so radical. You can't take these ideas and twist them like that. You're turning people astray. You're driving people away from God. And so the world can shape us, or we look at the example of what Jesus Christ kind of says, so no, I'm going to do it this way because this is who I am. And so we have this kind of external being shaped by the world, and we can kind of push back against how the world might shape us. And so there's this kind of outward. Now there's also the other flip side of that coin, that sometimes there's this kind of this inward take of kind of who I am is going to kind of define me and I'm going to break all the rules. And I think the, the best examples that come to mind about this kind of this, this inward sense of, oh, I can do this and strike out on my own, out of my own internal journey. You just got to go up the street to Orlando, go to Disney, and you can find any Disney heroine, Disney hero, and they're going to talk about they've kind of broken their own way and they're going to cast out all the rules and they're going to find out what they want to do based on internally kind of who they kind of think of themselves to be. But the thing I always kind of notice on these folks that kind of are defined by their own kind of inward compass is that as the story arc usually unfolds, they find out that it's usually through their sidekick or some talking animal that tells them that they really need other people. And so we can let the world shape us, we can try to kind of shape us ourselves, but at the end of the day, there's this inner dialogue of self-worth and this inner dialogue of how the world sees us, how we see ourselves. And so we find ourselves kind of playing what I call the comparison game, that between this kind of battle of inward and outward def definition of who we are and what we are worth, we try to compare ourselves with everyone else. And where does that kind of get us and how does that help us out? And so when we look at comparisons, I kind of want to get us back to basics a little bit. I want to kind of get us to go back to what scripture says. And so our message today from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 takes us where Paul is writing to the church in Corinth about external comparisons and how that is not healthy when you try to compare yourself to other people. Because usually somewhere in the mix of that, you're going to try and put yourself above somebody else, which means there's somebody who's kind of below in this, you know, easy to pay caste system. And so Paul wants to kind of get us back to basics when he says, this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Paul's kind of hitting the pause button to kind of say, hey, you know what? If we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ, then we are servants of Christ and stewards and caretakers of faith. Oh, now that gets a little bit easier, doesn't it? I'm like, oh, okay. I'd like to be a steward of these things. I could be a good steward of that. And, and I think I kind of understand what it means to be a, a servant to, to Christ and to be under the lordship of Christ. 
but unfortunately there's this kind of easy glossing over that we like to do when we hear this idea of being a servant to Christ. Because the actual text isn't just servant and it isn't just steward, but it's actually a slave to Christ. And not just any kind of slave to Christ, but what the text really tells us in the, in the actual Greek is that we're not just caretakers or servants, but he uses the Greek to say that we are, in fact, the galley slaves of Christ. And all of us are galley slaves, the lowest of the low, together. I don't know any of you ever watched movies like, uh, you know, about Helen of Troy and, and uh, the times of Ben-Hur, but... A galley slave was the person that was in the lowest possible station inside the boat and the drums would beat and you were literally the motor of the boat. You were literally rowing the oars. And so when Paul is calling us servants and slaves to Christ, he's using a language that puts us all the way at the bottom. And so the good news, though, is that if we are all in the boat together at the bottom, then this idea about comparison kind of goes away. And this idea of what it means to, to be a slave kind of gets easily fixed then. Because who we are, rowing the boat at the bottom together, then takes all of that sense of comparison and kind of takes it and puts it away. And so our self-worth that we've tried to kind of figure out, that Paul is saying, hey, stop comparing and realizing that if you are serving Christ, you're serving from the very bottom and you shouldn't get all caught up. And so that idea of maybe reframing our self-worth is that it's not going to come from the outside. And it's not going to come from the inside. But what if our self-worth were to come from above? What does God say in his word? What does he think of us? What is kind of core at the foundation of our self-worth? The value that we have in the eyes of God who looks down us from above. That our self-worth is kind of found in the fact that we are made in the image of God. And if you are made in the image of God and I am made in the image of God, kind of going back to this analogy, we're all kind of in all of this together, that that makes all of us valuable. God has created each one of us. And so there's this idea of being made in the image of God. And if we go back to this idea of Jesus as our master, consider the price that he paid. That accepting the lordship of God points back to what Jesus came to do. And every time we try to figure out some of these things about self-worth is that our sense of belonging to a, a God who loves us and made us in his image. That God came to save us from our sin and paid the highest price at the cross for us. Suffering shame, Jesus took our place, the things that were deserved for us, he took. Paid a high price so there should be some value there. It's a guy named Francis Schaeffer who, who had this to say about, about who we are. Calls us glorious ruins. There is glory in us. We are like Lamborghinis. We're like sports cars. That somebody ran into a tree. Busted, twisted metal, broken headlights radiator fluid all over the place. That we are glorious ruins, twisted, broken steel, 
car wrecks all twisted up. But the thing that our self-worth gets tied to isn't the wrecks that we are. But he says that God sees the beauty for whom we are and that we are worth repairing. The train wrecks that we are, the twisted, broken pieces that we are, when we hear those voices in our head that call us absolutely worthless, useless, that no one's going to love us. All those self-worth tapes that are easy playing in your head and in my head that just push us further and further down and further and further away in that sense of if God really knew what kind of train wreck, car wreck I was. He says, I know who you are and I'm in it with you anyway. If God really knew who I was, would he go to the cross anyway? Yes. So we are all in the same boat. There's no need for comparison. We're all made in the image of God. We're all kind of a fixer-upper opportunity, if you will. We're all sinners. We're all broken. But to consider this last piece of who we are in the eyes from looking above, that we are children of God. That we submit to the lordship of God, that we are looked at as his children. And when the world tries to define you, when you try to kind of figure out what your self-worth is and you think that you're worth nothing, but if you look up from the eyes of above, you see that you're made in the image of God, but that you're also a child of God. And, and look at what God says to his own son. That right there before the baptism at the River Jordan, a voice from heaven comes and says, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. When you're struggling with what your self-worth is all about, when you're wondering if you're worth repairing, this is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. This is mine. You are his. And he says, I am pleased. This one is mine. Breathe that in when you hear the haters hating. When you hear those voices in your own head telling you that you are worth, it, worth nothing, think about that voice that says, no, this one is mine. And in him, in you, I am well pleased. Just, just breathe that in. So you don't have to look outside for how the world is going to, to define. You have to look inside. Look up. Look up. God made you. God redeemed you. God loves you. Paul says that it is the Lord who judges me. And we submit to the Lordship of Christ. And you find yourself in the same boat with the rest of the followers. When you find yourself forgiven, when you find yourself redeemed, and you find yourself loved, that's the judge for me. The world's going to judge me and I'm going to always fall short. I'm going to judge myself and I'm always going to be disappointed. I'm going to look back at this video and say, man, I could do this better. I could be that better. I could eat better. I could work out better. So when you take that self-worth and you look at it from above, God loves you. God's redeemed you. You, you are worth something. He loves you so much, he sent his son to pay the ultimate price of pain and suffering and humiliation so that you could have a right relationship with him. So it's not that you're worth nothing. Instead, you're worth everything. The train wreck that we think that we are the busted Lamborghinis that we think we are. He says, I can repair that. I can fix that. It's worth fixing. So put that in your head instead of what the world is going to try to take away. Bask in it. Grow in it.
Amen. service is over. This idea about the things that God only knows about shame and grief and today now your sense of self-worth. Maybe this week there's a story you can share about how God has looked at you, loved you, and said you're worth repaying. Maybe there is a repair story to share this week of how you've gone from here to here and how God has been with you on the journey because I think there are some folks right now that are feeling pretty low, that are feeling pretty worthless, that are looking, saying, you know what, they're perfect if they knew me for me. And if you were to kind of move that veil aside and say, no, I was this. You know, we talk about this busted up Lamborghini. Let me tell you my story. Share those stories this week. Go and share it. Go and tell it. Go in the name of the Father, go in the name of the Son, and go by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as one church we say, amen.